You're listening to the Valley Labor Report. We are talking to Julia from Florida. She was part of a organizing effort at a cafe that Kyle talked to us about, actually, in the wee hours of the night uh, during our Mine Worker fundraising stream. And uh, Adam and I are both very big fans of Kyle. And this campaign was interesting to me and stuck out in my mind uh despite having listened to him tell us about it at like two in the morning on a sunday night (laughs) um a lot of people looking at it would maybe not think that it was ultimately successful but on a deeper level i think that it was and kyle thinks that it was and the people involved think that it was so uh we wanted to talk to julia who was a worker at this cafe about uh what it was like working there why she liked it why she wanted to organize it and uh what all the fallout of it was because um you know one of the reasons that i like stuff like this is is i came out of a faith tradition that really valued testimony for a lot of the same reasons that uh, the labor movement values education and inoculation. In in a lot of ways, it was it was pretty democratic. The services because uh, there were very few services that were like structured around sermons. At least at my church, very few. You could go, you could honestly go months without ever having heard a sermon. What you heard most of the time was individual members of the church getting up and giving testimonies about you know what the Lord has done for them this week. And while this is not exactly uh, what we're going to be doing here, you know, I think that sharing our experiences is good on a human level. It's good to help us understand people better. But also, I think in an organizing capacity, I hope it can be good for educational purposes, for inoculation purposes. You know, over the course of this series, we're going to hear a lot about what the bosses did and where they won or where they lost, the bosses, and maybe how we can take that into account in campaigns moving forward. So I'm really excited about this this conversation. Julia, can you introduce yourself and tell us about your experience working at the cafe and and what the name of the cafe is as well i'm sorry it it uh, slipped my mind all good um so yeah my name is julia uh i was working at dandelion cafe in florida for about three years the business itself was i think like 13 or 14 years old uh, a vegan restaurant um pretty big in the community and um there was some like pretty big like shifts in owner and management that I think affected our working conditions a lot um but basically Dandelion was toted as a community-based uh place of work um a community for people to come to um sustainable progressive all of the like uh, keywords of like the progressive movement right now but as workers we really didn't see that happening we didn't see our thoughts opinions suggestions ever being heard or done anything about or if it was it would ju- just be taken and like it was their idea um even the extensive website that they had didn't say anything about workers it was all about the mm customers and the people that came in and it was never about the people who actually made dandelion what it was um so yeah i mean it did foster a place for us as co-workers to really get to know each other and encourage each other and become lifelong friends Mo- a lot of us from them that still talk um we have a discord where we like post we have dinners um we'll go and see each other at our each other's works there's a few people who like from the seeds work together again at different restaurants so it definitely created a strong bond between us and i think at the base of it we knew that that community was really important and we could get a shitty job anywhere else but we wanted to keep working there and keep having that community and making it the best place for ourselves and each other to work out. What was it about the cafe that made it made it such that it built 
such strong bonds between you and your coworkers because I think there are a lot of people that have worked at a lot of shitty jobs and uh, that doesn't always happen. Um, there are jobs that I've worked where uh, I couldn't tell you even the names of <laughs> a lot of the people that I worked with and I'm sure that a lot of us have had similar situations. What was it about uh, the Dandelion Cafe that, that made it a place that... Um, that you had such strong bonds with, with the, the folks that work there? Um, that's something that we've definitely talked about, like as a group. And I don't think there is really one answer, but I just think it is the type of people that worked there that stuck through it. Uh, we would have like, it was called round table where at the end of the like shift, everyone would sit around the table, drinking beers and talking. Um, and so I think that was part of it. But at the same time, having such terrible management, it really relied on like the people who like stayed really had to make sure they talked to each other about like what was happening, because otherwise you would never find out. Um, so I think that that did quite a big um was quite a big point of the reason we were all so closely attached. And yeah, I don't know. We've talked about it and I can't really tell you why, but I do think one of the most important things to come out of this is knowing that you have to do what you can to know your coworkers. You have to reach out. You have to be friendly. You have to know their names because that is how community starts. And then that is how you can, build a union and help each other and like come together and come to the boss because it's really intimidating and doesn't really do anything if one person goes to the boss right. but if everyone goes to the boss or the majority that's when you get it and um if we didn't have that prior to being a union there's no way we would have been a union mm. right did you come to the dandelion with union background or like um because there are a lot of people who work service industry jobs couldn't tell you what a union is for instance i know that i yeah. uh when i worked in the service industry i couldn't have told you what a union was in any coherent fashion which is very unfortunate because i think at our restaurant at least for a certain amount of time there was a bit of that community there and i think that had any of us been properly educated about unions and how to do one uh we could have done something there and that restaurant could potentially still be there if, if, if we had come together to, to to make it more sustainable so so did you come to work at the dandelion with with that education about unions and how to start one and and what they can do for people how, how did Not that idea all. even get in your head so it it was definitely not i didn't know anything about it the only experience i had was having had shitty workplaces um which i think is a big part of realizing why you need this important but um no i had no idea it was just like round tables we would like complain and i was like wow like we do better when the owner isn't here and like wow we communicate if they just literally texted us this one thing like what was going to be on the fucking menu like we could do our job so much better and just talking about that for a while and then i can't remember which came first i think the discord came first we were like well let's have a way we can all talk that's not through like our employee hmm. communication like group chat so that came about and we would like talk about stuff. And then there was one guy, Robert, who is amazing. And he really like, y'all should unionize, I should unionize. And he was like, I know some folks at the IWW, like I'll put you together. So he's in that real organization, revolutionary education action league. But um, so he's like really big into just organizing and radicalizing people. And so he got us in touch with the IWW folks we really hit it off. Uh, it was about like four or five of us then. And I, we all just had the encouragement to keep doing it. And they're the ones who taught us everything. Like it took me so long to understand what the difference between like right to work versus like, um, uh, 
at will. Oh, whatever. <laughs> yeah, at will employment. And then, yeah. um, like, what the solidarity model is. And, like, all of these things, like, it took nine months of meeting and just, like, going over it and over it and over it. So then we could go back to our coworkers and explain it to them and explain, like, hey, we actually have laws that protect us. We have power that... Like, they're not legally allowed to do X, Y, and Z. We we are allowed to do X, Y, and Z. And if they fire us for that, we can go back at them and talk about pre-precedence and um, all of this other stuff. And what's the worst that could happen? We get fired. Right. Like, you know, so, so I didn't have any, like, formal knowledge, really, of unions. I didn't. Honestly, I didn't think unions were legal in Florida um, because of the uh, right to work. And um, so, yeah. Honestly, you know, I wonder about I wonder if even that is partly the labor movement's fault, maybe because of some of the like, I just I don't know, because there are so many people that have that conception about right to work, that right to work basically means right to work means at will. Right to work means unions are illegal. And I wonder if like maybe some of the hair on fire rhetoric from the labor movement about right to work maybe does that just as much as the boss's propaganda. But I mean, I but that that is a misconception that you that you hear a lot. I even hear union members that say, uh, you know, oh, we're in a right to work state so they can fire you anytime they want. And I'm like, uh, not if you have a union contract. That's not what right to work means. <laughs> you know, right to work only yeah. means that you can't have a uh, an agency fees uh, as a part of the contract. Like, that's literally it. It's a pretty narrow law in, yeah. in the grand scheme of things. Um, yeah. But what? So what did that education look like as as you're, you know, you have this you have this discord. Robert, I'm assuming, is an employee of, of the Dandelion Cafe or is he some like a friend outside of the cafe? At that, at that time, yeah. Um, but he really kind of just like sneakily got us in there and like <laughs> left because he has, you know, he has so many different organizations that he deals with. So he didn't really have time, mm-hmm. but he really like set us in the right direction and like sent us off, um, which was truly a blessing on on our end. So, um, yeah, we started just like going to the local restaurant next door kind of to where we were and talking about it and then moving on to going to more private spaces obviously because we didn't Mm -hmm. want people to overhear us and it took about nine or ten months of just talking about it Mm -hmm. and then reaching out slowly to people and being really cautious and like letting people know and it probably wasn't up until like two months until we became public that we got the majority of people in um because we were just trying to be super cautious about who we told because there were some people who were some of the most staunch people they were out on the picket line every day um and we didn't know if we could trust them because Mm -hmm. we didn't know if they were like buddy buddy with the bosses um uh because that's how they survived the job, you know? That's right. how they uh, made it through, but we couldn't tell from an outside perspective. But, yeah, so it was just that continuous education of knowing your rights, knowing what steps to take, because um, it's a lot. It's overwhelming. I We wouldn't – there is no way we could have unionized without the IWW. Hmm. Um at all so yeah so what were uh, some of the what were some of the conditions that got like what what are some of the things that made you dissatisfied to the to the point that um that you know your interest was piqued by um unionization talk because there are a lot of people that uh you know they they exist in environments where they have no interest in unionization because they are like content with the way things are. And, um, Mm -hmm. you know, they just, that they're not agitated about it. You know, what, what was the thing that made you like susceptible to, or made you, uh, 
that, that made you such that your interest would be piqued at the talk of unionization? Yeah. Like, what was going on at the cafe? Um, there was definitely, like, it was everything. So from um, people who had worked there, almost the entirety of it, like this one person in particular, they created so many of the recipes. They were there through the rocky transition of, like, owners. They had been in every single part of the restaurant they were making barely more than me um so like instances like that too with management I was the lead prep cook and I would come into shifts not knowing we had a special and not knowing anything about it I would have to ask like people on the line what it was and I was like people would ask like do we have more had no idea so just the breakdown of communication and then um, safety issues. Uh, Obviously when COVID happened, we had some big safety issues concerning COVID, but before that, just like the structural integrity of the building. um, And because our owners rented it, they really didn't see any need to put any money into the building Hmm. Um, so basically it was a 1920s house that was converted into a restaurant, pretty cool concept, but it's like a hundred years old building. Um, they're putting refrigerators, uh, stoves, all of this stuff on top. Um, I knew someone who came in who did floors and he said like, there's no support under this. Like these floors could collapse at any moment. Um, just like very slow on getting things fixed at all hiring people who weren't licensed to fix things like Mm. trades and stuff like that um so those were kind of the three big issues pay management and safety um but obviously there's all of the other small things that go into having complaints about where you work right i think that's really important that it's not just pay. And I think a lot of times, especially in the media, it's kind of chalked up to, you know, pay and benefits. Uh, but it's, it goes mm-hmm. beyond those bread and butter issues. And I think the, the types of things you're describing, no management is going to take that seriously if they don't have to. And mm-hmm. by unionizing, that gives you an actual voice in the workplace. And who knows how to run the workplace better than the workers themselves who are doing it day to day. And uh, Mm -hmm. those little communication things, I think, is so big because it piles up and it just makes your your day that much harder. Um, In the case of this, Uh you know, that's that's hurting your relationship with customers, making it harder Mm -hmm. on you. I mean, you things like that is what contributes to being, you know, verbally abused by customers. Um, Yeah. Any number of issues that. You know, maybe in isolation don't seem huge, but they all pile up and they all go, they all point to this vertical relationship where, you know, the owner, the manager, they are the dictator in, in a workplace and, and see no need or, uh, you know, responsibility to communicate or to uh, negotiate with the workers. And, you know, I think mm-hmm. that's, uh, that's very interesting to me that you you're you're talking about it from the perspective of a small cafe especially one that's kind of couched in liberal language and uh, that Uh was also one of the things that really stood out to me about this story is i mean we've all you know if you've been to anywhere urban you've seen some sort of hippy dippy cafe uh, Uh sort of like what you're describing and um, yeah You know, not to stereotype, but they seem to cater towards upper middle class liberal types who, you know, maybe have a rainbow flag bumper sticker on their uh, BMW. (laughs) Um, (laughs) You know, so that that really that fascinates me, you know, just the the dichotomy there and, and sort of the image that's put out for the outside versus what actually happens in the nitty gritty workplace yeah yeah and i think one thing that's one instance that stands out to me was you know we were talking about the need for management the need for shift leads and you know people who are paid extra because they have a key 
and we were talking about to our the the owner person it was it was weird it was like a family owned so the man uh man chris owned it his wife cheryl worked there then married him then became like an a manager and then her brother started who became like a manager so i call them all owners even though it's just one person's an owner because it's just a family Hmm. um but so we're explaining to the owner why we are putting we are doing manager things without getting compensated for it and he was like like what and i was like well we have keys and he was like what is that like 15 extra seconds and i was like do you really not understand the like risk of giving someone a key like right yeah i could break in like i know the codes i could get to Mm -hmm. like what are you talking about it's just 15 seconds like that is a load of responsibility like just the complete oh that's nothing oh yeah it's not hard for what we're doing i was gonna say if someone did break in uh they would certainly remember that you had keys right and not only yeah. that but like if you have keys that means presumably you're closing and presumably there are nights when you're closing and you're the last one to leave like i remember occasions yes. where i left the restaurant that i worked at at like two in the morning at, as I was, you know, the person with the keys, the person who, like, I, you know, my title was assistant manager. I didn't have the the, the ability to hire or fire anybody. Uh, but, you know, basically I had the keys. I ordered the groceries and I did the numbers at the end of the night. And so I had been by myself. It was a really long night. I'd been by myself for like two hours at this point. The la- other last person left at midnight. And so I was leaving the restaurant by myself at two in the morning. And then this is a restaurant where we, have, we had found... Um, needles and uh like various like indications of people like hanging out in the back that were not employees of the store you know and we had also been robbed like twice in the past uh six months at this time you know and so like the the you know the the extra responsibility of course the added 15 seconds of course you should be compensated for that but also the safety aspect right like that i'm sacrificing you Mm -hmm. know leaving at 2 a.m on a saturday night in a place where there has been like uh, you know, the, there there is indications that, like, it is possible for my safety to be in jeopardy. And, you know, for that not to be recognized is really absurd. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, just um, a lot of things like that. And it was important to us, like, you know, if you're just getting paid. And that's another thing. When we came up to them, when we finally went public, we gave them a letter of our intent to unionize and basically like we want to talk Mm -hmm. and the end goal wasn't to like we need more money we need all of this it was like show us what you can afford if you can't afford to pay us okay we know that we knew they could but okay whatever like show us like if you can't show us if you can't pay us maybe do some extra things that will help us and let it be easier on us um but obviously we never even got to that point Right. Yeah. Well, the I I definitely I want to dive into that a little bit before. But before we get there, could, you said that you couldn't have done this without the IWW. Could you talk? Could Could you talk some about like what was it? In what ways did the IWW kind of writ large help y'all out? And in what ways did y'all see that as, um, you know, uh, different than, is, is there anything that the IWW provided that, that maybe other unions didn't or wouldn't, or would be less interested in? Like, just, just talk to us about y'all's relationship as people in, in the IWW and, and with the IWW. Um, so I think the, a big point with the IWW was the fact that they saw what we wanted to do as a, great idea a good campaign um that we were worthy of it even though it wasn't like a big chain or you know a big thing it was just you know a few of us that wanted to do it it was still a worthy cause and um then after that just the constant and constant and continuous education was so big it was so huge and um the consistency of it, the willingness of these people who have their own jobs, 
their own lives, to give us free advice, free education, free labor. Um, we really just like phenomenal people. Um, this is their passion. And then, you know, once we were getting closer telling us, okay, these are the steps you're going to do. Like this is, um, you need to write a letter. You need to open up social medias, like just the steps of what we needed to do so we could fall in line and do them. Um, and then helping us write up like our, intent to unionize writing up our social media posts um when things would happen all of a sudden like being there in the middle of the night spending Mm -hmm. eight hours a day working on stuff um just like out on the picket lines with us organizing stuff for us so we could focus on like talking to uh members of the community um really just being there and knowing really pushing us when we were like getting down like i don't know and just being like no what you guys are doing is worthy you guys are you know you know fuck everyone like fuck the bosses like you guys can do this um yeah yeah just truly an inspiring crew right right that's awesome yeah that that's really great i i really i really love to hear that um so the so we've you know we're kind of walking through walking through your story and and the story of of the uh the dandelion cafe um you get everybody on or you get the majority of people on board and you said that you sent a letter of intent to unionize and and you said that there weren't very many demands in that letter can you go into some some more detail about about the letter itself and management's reaction to that so i kind of need to go a little bit before we gave the letter okay so we had continuously throughout covid our boss was like you guys have to be safe you have to be safe if anything happens we have to close the restaurant down she gets covid and they do not close the restaurant down. They barely tell employees what's happened. They don't, they ask if we should close. We say no. They go, okay, whatever, we're staying open. Um, a few of us, like, who could afford it stayed home and waited until we tested negative. They didn't tell the community. They lied about mm. an employee getting compensation when it was an owner manager of course getting oh, compensated because no. they own the place <laughs> um so that really made a lot of us mad and that is what like got us like we're gonna do this we're gonna write a letter it's gonna happen it got a lot of the people who we didn't know if they were cool with this got a lot of them on board um So now we're ready. We're going to give them the letter. We want to do it as a group. So we have one, one of our workers, she has another job. So she's safe that if anything happens, she, we come up with a letter all together, like a post. And she basically says, Hey, we would like a employee meeting where we can discuss some things. And then we were planning on giving them the letter. They, said this is inappropriate we've told you not to message about employee meetings and fired her and then in a private message our boss basically told her that she was um bullying her so jen the employee was bullying the boss by asking for an employee meeting we have not had an employee meeting in two years yeah so this request for this this request for an employee meeting this was not the letter this was an individual employee asking for an employee meeting asking for an employee meeting on as a like she was asking for an employee meeting for all of us like we had all come together we'd all written what she was going to say okay. and then she was the one person to post it i see um, so this is the letter that you're talking basically about. okay it's the attempt to give them the letter i see if that makes sense okay it's the attempt to like have all of the owners at the same place have all of the um, employees who are in the union, all of us sitting down and giving them the letter. Like I said, we hadn't had an employee meeting in two years. Um, 
and that is just wild like yeah. talking to other people in the restaurants in orlando they're like what the hell like that's how insane. long had you been, so, how long had you been working at the dandelion cafe at this time three years okay yeah and um so jen got fired and which we were all like what the fuck like yeah. what what and so we instantly had a meeting about that talked about it so we knew at that point we were going to file a um unfair labor practice about that because she was working like in protected concerted activity so we knew that was going to happen i was like okay we just have to give them the letter um so then that happened saturday so then monday after work we gave them the letter and what did the letter say? What was in the letter? So the letter was, we are the workers of Dandy, the Seeds. Um, we are a union. We would like to have a discussion about, like, these issues, basically pay, safety, and management. Um, if anyone wants to go read the letter, we, as soon as we handed it to the bosses, we posted it on our Instagram and Facebook at the seeds and it's the underscore seeds underscore um but we posted everything we were doing like we were completely transparent so if anyone wants to read the full letter it is there but basically what i've told you like we we want to talk about these things so (laughs) i just want to make sure i'm clear here you asked or y'all asked for a meeting to discuss concerns (laughs) Um, you yep. didn't threaten to send the boss to nope. the gulag to the guillotine. <laughs> nope. You did not. You didn't nope. say you were going to go on strike or, or picket the restaurant, nope. sabotage the nope. restaurant. You asked for a damn meeting to talk about concerns, yep. and yep. Uh, you chose someone to kind of be your your delegate, someone who had another mm-hmm. job and kind of felt more safe, you know, being out front. And this person was fired for having the audacity to make this request. Yeah. Well, she all she just asked for a meeting. Yeah. So she didn't even and then go no. even far. deliver the letter. It was just anybody. No, no. Even like she was like, "Hey, COVID's happening. I think we should all talk about COVID, wow. like as a group." That's bullying. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, that was Jesus that was Christ, that, That's wow. crazy. That's insane. Yeah. So y'all give them so so this is so we are Monday after work, you've given them the letter. Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. and this is after they have already fired somebody for requesting a meeting outside of the letter. Mm-hmm. So like it's possible mm-hmm. they didn't even know about like the union stuff at, at uh, until Monday after work. What is their reaction to yeah. the letter? Okay, so it was, I think, five of us. That it was about, it was afternoon. So around three or four, five of us were like, hey, Cheryl, we need to talk to you. Here's this letter. We love you. We love this place. Um, but we're a union. Gave them the letter. She was just like, kind of frozen and just like (laughs) okay and walked away and then seven i think seven hours later we all got an email saying uh dandelion is officially closed for a week um we will open back like we will we're closed for a week um so they locked us out of our jobs Wow. which is wow. an unfair labor practice because it is retaliation against the workers right. for becoming a union. So uh, again, we're, you know, we posted the thing, we feel great. And then we get this email and I think we were on a call with IWW. We were just about to get off. We were just talking about video games and, you know, whatever. And we get this email and we're all like in live, like, wait 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 a second like we're locked out and so stayed up for another like three hours making a post about being locked out and what it means and deciding what to do the very next day you know the iww they know what to do they're like we're gonna set up a picket line you guys are locked out we're gonna be out there telling the community what's up like 
When people come up, we'll let them know we're going to be right outside of it. We're not going to be on their property. We're going to have a sign-in sheet. We're going to have posters. We're going to have a um, picket line with a megaphone. We're going to have chants, <laughs> all of that um, right away. You know, So the next day, we're out there. I think we do two shifts a day, like in the morning and then the evening. Um, and the other thing is Dandelion has a huge community. We... Mm-hmm. We had so many people walking through that door, like ten thousand dollar days. Like it was, wow, it was big. It was, you know, a lot of people came through, and they didn't post anything about being closed. We had people coming from an hour away. We had people coming from South Florida um, to eat there, and they're like, "What? What? Wait, you guys are closed?" And so we handed them literature. We explained to them like, "We want to be working. This is not a strike. This is a lockout." Um, we want to be back in there, like making food for y'all, but this is what happened. Wow. What was, so we, yeah. uh, uh, what was the reaction from customers and just sort of the community? And I'm, I'm guessing y'all had a lot of regulars. Um, you know, mm-hmm. it sounds like you had a, a, a pretty big following in the, in the whole region. Um, what was the reaction from some so, of the folks? Everyone face to face. So we were out there, like everyone that we talked to face to face they were like wow this sucks like well we can't wait till you open back again we support you like etc online it was a little different we had a lot of people saying that we were lazy we just didn't want to work how dare we close a restaurant in the middle of pandemic um ungrateful there were people who were saying that they hoped we never got jobs anywhere else um you were All locked out, though. Stuff. I mean, and yeah. that's, I, yes. I think that was a yes. very, very important distinction. There's a difference between yeah. a strike and a lockout. Uh, you did mm-hmm. not decide to stop working. The boss decided yep. that you were yep. not going to work. How that's many, different. Th- how Another many of the interest- people do you think that are commenting these, like, bootlicky things, like, how many people do you think of those were actually, like, people that would have gone to the restaurant because it sounds like this is supposed to ha- it, it sounds like this is like a company that kind of catered to the people that would have you know like in this house we believe black lives matter science or something <laughs> in the front they God, science is real so how basically you know people who say black lives matter and then will go and commit microaggressions uh, it was those types of people uh, so it was the type of people who are like you should have a fair workplace but this is a small business, you know, can they really afford that? Like there are people too. So it's, wow. it's that type of crowd of like very liberally, like, yeah, they they'll probably, say what they want to say, but they don't mean it. They and, probably um, thought just it, asking for a meeting was a microaggression in itself. <laughs> I mean, clearly, yes. um, yeah. how dare you disturb yeah. an right. owner with a private yep. message? Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, this is like the most 21st yeah, it, century late stage cap. I mean, this really, this is America. Oh yeah. Um, God. Yeah. This is, that, I, I mean, that's, like, so, that's why it's so fascinating. In the, mission statement, <laughs> in the mission statement online for Dan Lyon, I don't know what the whole thing was, but the one thing that stands out to me was um, conscious capitalism. Oh, <laughs> my God. <laughs> Holy uh-huh. Well, we so see like, how that oh, works. You no, know you're exploiting your workers. <laughs> okay. Conscious. Yeah, that's how, if, you, if you're saying it's conscious capitalism, that's how you know that uh, it's not. <laughs> yes, yes, oh my yes. God. That was right next to sustainability and progressive. Oh, Jesus. So that's why I do not trust either of those words anymore. But yeah. um, it was actually interesting because our online following, there was a good handful of people who had never been there would never be there. Mm -hmm. They just wanted to complain. There was a good handful of people who loved the restaurant, didn't care about us as workers, just wanted to get back open. A handful of people who were the owner's friends who were like, you guys are terrible. I know the owners. They would never. And then there was at least two accounts that were the owners. (laughs) And that was one of our unfair labor practices. We went into NLRB for was uh, spying on us because these two accounts were very similar, had similar similar following followers posts, had similar bios, and one of the accounts was actually shown to an employee by the boss about this is my Finsta. I use it to look at people's accounts, mm. and she was posting things like 
well, how do we know you weren't planning on striking? You have a hardship fund, like, you know, basically aggravating people to comment and stuff like that. So once actually an old employee was like, hey, this is obviously Cheryl, like, (laughs) like, like, these are the reasons it's Cheryl. And that they stopped commenting. The comments completely stopped after that point. Oh, my God. It's it's just yeah. it's just bizarre. I mean, everything yeah. about this is just so bizarre. So yeah. Uh, all right. So what are you know what happens after after this? They say that they uh, are going to open back and open up in a week after a week of locking you mm-hmm. out. Did they ever open back mm-hmm. up? No, they said stay tuned for like when we open back up. A week happens, and we get an email saying, here are your final checks. Uh, Dandelion is closed. Wow. Um, and then, you know, we look online. The website is completely taken down. and it says, because of COVID, we had to close. Um, yeah, so it felt really weird, and it didn't feel like closure at the time. Um, but, you know, we got with IWW. We had... We knew we were going to file ULPs, unfair labor practices, to the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board. We did that. Um, I think they filed 10 in total. The NLRB said that four of them were viable, um, and we settled out of court. Um, We did not settle for any money. No one got any money. It was basically just the... uh, owners were had to like have a sign saying like and if they if they opened a business in the next two years they had to have a sign saying that you have the rights to do x y and z like you have the rights to be in a union you have the rights to talk about this they also had to send all of us that letter so a few of us have it hanging in our houses um but and also that the NLRB would be keeping a close eye on them. Um, And it is actually significant. And, you know, you're talking about the superficiality. It may not seem like it was worth anything, but it is significant because that is, I don't, maybe one of a few cases, if any, of a ULP is actually going through and getting settled. Like that is, we were setting a precedent. Yeah, it's um, it's very hard to do. So that also just showing the community like, hey, this is happening because right before we, our thing happened, there was another scandal at another vegan vegetarian restaurant in Orlando with um, racist claims and sexual harassment cases. So, um, yeah, it was kind of just about showing the community like if a uh, bosses and a company doesn't treat you right you can shut them down like you can shut them down like orlando like be cautious like you have to treat your employees right or they can shut you down um because it has happened to an establishment that's been open over a decade um and i know of places who they're definitely good places to work who they had meetings about what happened to us um and like okay what can we do to make sure that type of um frustration doesn't happen here wow that, so i think it really yeah that's that's a ripple effect that you guys had on the entire mm-hmm. community so yeah i mean mm-hmm. i think and we've talked about this a lot on our show about how weak the nlrb is under current law um mm-hmm. you know and that's a, a theme of our show that you you have to have organizing power you can't just rely on the law to protect you especially in states such as yep. florida and alabama uh, but I think that's that's a much deeper thing than just a piece of paper that you got. Uh, mm-hmm. But and another takeaway that I have from this, and this is also something we've talked about before, and I know uh, our brother David has talked about this as well, that oftentimes management and owners, when push comes to shove, sometimes control means more to them than money. Mm-hmm. And yep. being able to... Come. Yeah, being able to dictate to people, to control, um, you know, like I said, as a little petty dictatorship inside that building or office or restaurant, 
sometimes that means more to them than their profit mm-hmm. margins. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like we knew it wasn't going to be easy because we had seen how defensive they got, and they got so defensive. Like, and you couldn't say anything without, you know, like, oh, why don't we have this sauce on the menu? Why does it only come on this thing? Because, you know, we have DIY bowls. It's like, oh, well, well, these are the reasons we don't have it on because, you know, we would have to make more. And it's like, oh, okay. Like, you Bosses know, stay being defensive thing. about just <laughs> about little things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, yeah. So, yeah, we knew it wasn't going to be easy at all, but we, we definitely didn't think that. Uh, they would take it that far. And that is amazing that these, <laughs> you know, like presumably this is a project, you know, I mean, 13 years, God, a project that you've spent 13 years of your life creating and you're willing to, I mean, that's such a like, I'm going to pick up my ball and go home, like mm-hmm. childish moment that like you're willing mm-hmm. to throw away 13 years of your life because, mm-hmm. uh, the people that made your restaurant possible wanted a meeting like holy shit like Mm -hmm. that's like just the worst kind of person like i can't imagine like like there there are very few worst types of people that i can imagine i mean that's bonkers yeah yeah well Uh, it was it was yeah, I was just going to say, I, I think that that speaks to something because in our country, we're taught to worship the small business and, you know, the family mm-hmm. owned business. And, and like and most people, if, if I can spend my money locally, of course, that's what I do. I'd rather it right. go to a local company or, or local restaurant than a chain or multinational corporation. But I think it's such a, it's almost taken for granted. By both parties, by all the media that, you know, the small business people are, you know, the heroes of this country, the backbone of the country. We hear Mm -hmm. that a lot. And, you know, when you dig deeper and sometimes you don't even have to dig that deep to see that a lot of times these are just little wannabe dictators. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's I think that small businesses are also used as a way to push the agenda of um, less viable working conditions like oh yeah. there's no possible way we can raise the minimum wage because what about the the small right. business owners? right and it's like they're used as a way of making people who are not making anywhere near a living wage spout out lies about like well we can't have this we can't have that right. because small businesses or like of course the small business isn't treating you well it's a small business and it's right. like None of this is acceptable. If you don't have the money, if you don't have the necessary equipment and management to run a business, you don't deserve to run a business, period. So you shouldn't you shouldn't be able to. That's right. right. Your right to own a business and profit off someone's labor should not trump someone's right to life and safety and dignity. Mm -hmm. And I think that Mm -hmm. uh, what you just said is is very I mean, really profound about our economy, because that is um, the expectation. I think you're exactly right that we are trained to lower our expectations, and small businesses play a big role in that. Because, you know, after all, how could we give you a raise? You know, we got to put my brother on the payroll. Mm -hmm. You know, we got to put our Mm -hmm. mama and them on the payroll. We couldn't Mm -hmm. possibly have a union in our workplace. I mean, how are we going to feed our cousins and our uh, fraternity brothers? You know, that's the the sort of BS that we get often from, you know, the small business propaganda. And and like you said, just Mm -hmm. because a business is small does not mean that you cannot pay people a living wage and provide uh, democratic input, mm-hmm. proper safety. You know, that whether yeah. there are five if, workers or 500 workers, uh-huh. that should be if anything, an expectation. I think that yeah, small business owners and places should be looked at more, you know, more strictly. They should be analyzed more because... You are small. You are able to talk to 
the owner to Mm -hmm. the person doing the dishes. You're able to have conversations. You're able to like find out what they need. You're able to do it. And if you can't talk to them about how you can't and with big corporations, at least, you know, it's big. They, they literally can't do that. So I think that small business should, should be even more like, um, criticized for not being able to do that. So Julia, why is this in your in in, in your mind and and in the presumably and I guess you can correct me if this isn't the case and presumably in the minds of your uh you know fellow workers in the union, why is this a ultimately like positive thing that you did? Like because a lot of people that that I that I grew up with, especially that that don't have like a union mindset, uh, they would hear this story and think, "See, this is exactly why um, unions are not are are not practicable." They, uh, you know, look the business closed, and now they don't even have a they don't even have that job anymore whereas at least before they tried to get all uppity uh they had that job yeah this is what happens when you rock Mm -hmm. the boat and make trouble what (laughs) what is it about this campaign that like made you walk away from it feeling like good about what you did and good about your decisions and that like you would do it again so i Speaking for myself, and I do think um, the majority of my uh, comrades, the people from the Seeds, would agree. Um, it made it a success because we actually tried. You know, people were telling us that we were being lazy, etc. I have never worked harder in my life than that week we were locked out and weren't technically working. I worked so hard with my coworkers. Um, we fought for each other. We fought so we could have a really good workplace. We loved each other so much that we were willing to stay and do hours of unpaid free labor to make this business where we wanted to work, to make it successful enough that we were going to be able to get paid more and could get safer conditions and management. We worked so hard to make that business the best it could be so we could keep working there. And that's what made it a success. Like them not listening to us and closing the restaurant is on them. That's on them. Like we, you know, we're always told like, do the best you can leave it better than when you found it. We could all have just quit and found a new job. They could have hired more people, but even if we did, you know, everything did go through and they were a union, they're still open they would be a union and people could come in and get a living wage. And like, and then that would also be a success. So if that couldn't be possible, I'm glad they're not open anymore because it sends a message that you cannot treat your workers like this. It doesn't matter if you are a progressive, local, sustainable, vegan cafe, like you still have the responsibility as deciding to be business owners to treat your employees just as good as you treat your customers. And if you can't, you shouldn't have a business. So now that business that couldn't do that isn't open anymore. Um, so, yeah. And uh, for the most part, a lot of us are at other jobs that maybe are the same, you know, or we're doing other things like with the mangrove co-op uh, with, the real revolutionary education action league um you know people getting jobs in their actual fields what they want to do um you know all of these things and it it was hard when we all got laid off because a lot of us went on unemployment we didn't know what to do but um you know we're still a community we're still friends um we can reach out to one another and ask for help. I've never had a job like that. I've never had a job where we are actually still friends, even though none of us work there anymore. Right. That's wild. And this is a restaurant. It's not like a, you know, decade long career at some place. It's a restaurant. You 
that doesn't really happen. And I've worked at a few and it's never happened. Um, so I think that's why it was a success. Along with obviously setting a precedence and et cetera. Right. Like that's also right. really big, but a per- like personally, that's why. Talk to us some about the Mangrove Collective. So the Mangrove Collective is a co-op technically under Florida. We're not a co-op, but we're a co-op. Um, it's five of us from the seeds. Um, it started off like a lot bigger and a lot more, but it really like filtered down into um, who had the time um, to do it, who wanted to do it, you know, et cetera. So it's five of us now. We are striving to be a worker owned business and um, co-op and have bylaws that express what we want in a place of work. We want to be um, held to a higher standard um, than what is currently the standard in businesses. Um, We don't want to be that small business that gets away with stuff just because we're a small business. We want to be a a collective of people like making decisions. Um, We want there to be um rules and if one of us messes up there's uh you know reprimands and we want to be called out we want to do the best we can we don't want to get defensive um we want to create a workplace we've always wanted to work at um another big thing is to not have a boss um as a worker owned co-op we're all the boss we're all the owner um so hopefully as it gets bigger, we'll have different worker member options. So if people don't want that load of responsibility, there's still a way for them to be a part of it while still having um, democratically like uh, made uh, rules and uh, just things we do. So, yeah, yeah. And, and what kind and and, we're, oh, I'm sorry uh, I was just going to say right now we're focusing on food so plant based stuff we have like um, ranch cashews chili lime cashews um, pizza time crackers these are all things that we've been working on for the past year um, crafting the recipes figuring out how they work the sizing the money you know we have people in this who are cooks we have mm-hmm. people who are business like major like minors um social media people like artists so we have a good group of people like able to get this off the ground we want to eventually be bigger have like serving meals like hot food mm-hmm. um have a brick and mortar where we can have events we can have like free potlucks for people to come and eat um free events to educate about everything from white supremacy and uh, colonialism to sex education um that's the the very far future goal right. but uh it is it is the goal sounds like y'all want to do kind of like a red emma's thing i don't know how familiar you are with uh are you familiar at all with red emma's no, I'm not, but I will. I will be. <laughs> yeah, check them out. They're uh, at one. They they're a co-op, worker owned co-op. I, I've been up there once, and at that time, like they have what you're talking about as far as like the people that don't want to be, that don't want to like, uh, you know, be owners per se. Like they have ways where you can be like worker members, uh, but you can only be on there if you're like on a path to ownership. And the last time I went up there, they had like 16 owners, I think. Um, and they're a oh, coffee wow. house, cafe and bookstore. Um, it's very okay. cool. Anytime I see a book, uh, I always, that I want, that's like, you know, union or lefty type politics. I always check Red Emma's because they, they have an online bookstore and you can, go there so anytime i get a book i try to get one from red emma's as well uh or instead of like amazon or something like that but um Mm -hmm. but they have they Mm -hmm. do lots of events a lot of community stuff and 
uh, like lectures and I think they do some concerts and, uh, you know, it's just like, it's a really cool, like community space. It's like a coffee house, a cafe and a bookstore all in one per Like, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's like super cool. And at one point they were an IWW certified co-op. I'm not sure if they're still in the IWW or not. Um, I think I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure all their members are, or all their owners, you know, the worker owners are, but, but any, anyway, mm-hmm. um, I think they would probably be a good resource for you as, yeah. as you start um, trying to build up. Do y'all do any, like, like, do you deliver any of your stuff or is it like, is it just like pop-ups? Like I'm trying to figure out if like I can order anything and you send it to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we are trying to, we're just doing pop-ups right now. Um, we are still figuring the mailing system because um, one thing that's important to me is our packaging. So our packaging is 100% home compostable. But because of that, I don't know exactly how it's going to ship. So we have to practice with that a little bit. Um, and then just figuring out all of the ordering and stuff like that. One thing that we kind of pride ourselves and have to remind ourselves often is we're doing this slowly mm-hmm. in order for it to actually work, not... Mm-hmm jumping in and fixing problems along the way but having the answers before the problems arise for the most part (laughs) there's obviously going to be problems we don't know are going to happen but um and we also have second we have other jobs um and lives and families so we're going slowly but if people follow oh i gave the wrong instagram handle earlier we changed it from to the mangrove collective uh, the mangrove underscore collective. I'm sorry about that, y'all. But um, we have, you know, the info of what we're doing. And um, if you want to know anything about like the seeds, that's also on there. So hopefully we will be mailing stuff soon and delivering and doing the pre-orders and all that. I um, think that's very so cool what y'all yeah. are doing. Uh, you know, the story itself is, is really cool, but uh, I love that y'all have banded together to do this and you're tapping different types of talents because it really does take all mm-hmm. kinds of folks to to work mm-hmm. together on a team like this so i'm, I'm wishing you all the success uh for this collective Thank and I'm, I'm really i'm rooting for y'all and hopefully soon uh yeah we can get some pizza crackers up here in uh, north alabama yeah. to snack yeah. on and and support our brothers and sisters yes. down in florida yeah keep us in the loop on that Thank for real. You. Yeah, we'll do. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, and even like small things like, uh, so we've had four events now, three of them with like a, a tent. And when I was 18, I was working a really bad job where I had to do a farmer's market all by myself, setting up all the produce and everything, the oh. table, the uh, tent. <laughs> And now doing it with a group of people where we can have shifts, we can mm. leave the table. It is like, I think I'm the only one out of the the group that's done this before, but it is such a difference. It's such a relief. It's such a relief to be like, hey, I'm sick today. Like, can someone else do this task I was supposed to do? It is, I don't know how people do this by themselves, like. It is amazing, and I'm so thankful for my coworkers every day for the opportunity. Because obviously, it can't just be one of us; it has to be all of us. So, yeah, I'm also thankful for all of them. That's awesome. Yeah, we're really looking forward to hearing what y'all are able to do with the Mangrove Collective. Looking forward to getting some pizza crackers up here. Is there anything that that you wanted to? Uh, close with or Adam did you have anything else you wanted to ask her no I just I really appreciate your time and willingness to speak with us and uh, you know I'm I'm inspired by what you shared and the the quote that is sticking with me right now is we tried Mm -hmm. and hell that's all Mm -hmm. we can do if you want anything to happen at your place of work you have to get to know your coworkers. it doesn't have to be big leaps and bounds at first but like asking them how their day was asking them how they're doing, if they need help, if they need some ibuprofen for their back, just being that comrade, being that person that you want at your work. That's the biggest part. And even if you don't join a union or become a union, at least you have a little community of uh, people to help you and join your local IWW. So yeah, that's it. (laughs) 
Thanks, Julia. Yeah, I've had a great time talking to y'all. Thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed this conversation.